Welcome to ACCA's presentation of NAIT certification for service technicians. This is on the specialty of air-to-air -air heat pumps. Uh, this is part one electrical. All right, my name is Jack. Jack Rise, like Sunrise, I'm going to be your presenter. So you're stuck with me for the next four CDs. <laughs> All right. Uh, basically, briefly, I've uh, been a contractor for 18 years in wholesale distribution for 13 years and worked for a major manufacturer for five years. So I've been around the block and um, I have a I'm NATE certified, I'm certified in a lot of different areas, and I, I think I can be of some help to you preparing for this exam. Our uh, purpose here is to give you the information you're going to need to sit and successfully pass the NATE air-to-air heat pump exam, this specialty exam, all right? Um, this is progressive, so make sure you understand part one before going on to part two. Um, Suggested materials have a pocket calculator handy or some way of calculating while you're sitting with this program because uh, questions are going to be mathematical in nature and they're not going to be the kind that you can do by hand. You're going to need a calculator. Um, uh, the user assumes all liabilities. Uh, the user of the information contained herein assumes all liabilities relative to its application. We can only explain to you how things work. We can't know how you perceive that, nor how you intend to apply it in the field. So if you have any doubt in your mind whatsoever as to an application for something we've talked about, get in touch with me, get in touch with ACA, RSES, and somebody who has information that can help you better understand that. Take a course, whatever it is you need to do. First things first, this is service technician training, okay? Uh, not installation, this is service, okay? There's two different areas. This is for air-to-air -air heat pump, and there's a test for installers, and there's a test for service technicians, all right? So make sure you're the service guy here because that's the exam you're going to get, and it's completely different from the installation exam. An exam consists of 150 total questions as follows you're going to have a separate test with 50 questions on the core information, basic general information. Then you choose a specialty for 100 questions. All specialties have a 100 question uh, test associated with them. But you can't be certified in anything until you've passed the core. So you shouldn't be starting with this set of CDs. You should be preparing either to take a 150 question exam or you've already passed the core. And maybe you took the heat pump exam before and you didn't do well on it and you want to retest it. You can do that too. Because once you pass the core, you have two years to pass a specialty to get a certification. Because you're only certified once you've passed the core and a specialty. Specialties being air to air heat pump, gas heating. Air conditioning, there's a bunch of cores, I think about seven, air distribution, they go on and on. Hydronics, gas, uh, hydronics, oil, oil is a certification in and of itself. 70% in each area, not collectively, in each area, 70% of 50 and 70% of, you have to answer 70, at least 70 of the questions correct in this exam, and at least uh, 35 in this exam to pass. You're given a maximum of four hours to take the exam. You can take as many exams as you want as long as you've made that arrangement with the provider, whoever is giving you that exam that day, the proctor. All right, But you have four hours. At the end of four hours, he's going to stand up and collect the papers whether you're done or not. And if you're not done, if you left a question blank, it will be counted as wrong. If you answer any one question with two answers, oh, I think it's both A and C, then that's going to be counted wrong also. So your job is to find the most correct, the best answer of the A, B, C, D options you're given. Bring a pocket calculator to the exam, but not your computer, not the calculator in your phone. You can't use those. The only thing on your desk is going to be a number two lead pencil, a pocket calculator, 
and whatever exam information the proctor gives you. That's it. Okay, you can't have a phone that could let you connect with the outside world. You can't have a computer that would let you connect with the outside world. Any device that does that is not allowed in the room. This is a proctored, monitored exam. Successful completion can earn multiple certifications. If you pass the service core exam and a service specialty in air to air heat pumps, then you get four certifications. You get service certification in heat pumps, you get installation certification in heat pumps, you get service certification in air conditioning, and service certification in air conditioning installation. Okay? Uh, not service certification and installation. You get installation and service. Whenever you pass a service exam, regardless of what it is, air conditioning only, uh, gas, heating. If you pass the gas service technician, you get gas service plus gas installation certification. All right. When you take an installation exam, you just get that certification. So it works down, if you will, not up. Okay. Progressive rather than regressive. Successful completion can earn multiple certifications. If you've taken a NATE exam before in the past, then you were given a NATE ID number. You've got to bring that ID number to class. That's the only way NATE's going to know to look for your past records. So let's say you took these two exams, the NATE heat pump specialty and the core exam. You passed the core and you failed the uh, specialty exam. Now you're retesting in the specialty exam. If you don't bring that ID number, they won't know you passed that core or less than two years ago. So let's go forward. This is uh, this section. There's four sections. This one is on electricity. We have a section on airflow. We have a section on refrigeration. And we have a section on heat pumps. Uh, that is to say components system circuits that deal only with heat pumps. Most of what we're going to talk about is air conditioning by nature because a heat pump, an air to air heat pump, is an air conditioning system. Okay, the, the direction of refrigerant flow is reversed so that in this winter time the hot gas is going inside the house and in the summertime the hot gas is going outside the house. So that, that's the only very basic difference. So everything we're talking about here applies to air conditioning and heat pump. That's why when you pass the service exam, you get air conditioning certification as well. Electricity is the flow of electrons through a conductor. What the heck's an electron? Well, <clears throat> electrons are these little things in this model. Now understand this is a model of an atom. It happens to be a helium atom. Helium, as you know, is a light gas. It has in the center of the nucleus, contained in there, are two protons that are positively charged and two neutrons which have no charge. They just add to the mass. So there's two and two. Then out, so this is essentially a large positively charged body. These electrons, there's two of those that orbit around this, just like the Earth orbits around the Sun. They are negatively charged. They are the electrons that flow through conductive material that is electricity, is the definition of electricity. Let's talk about these electrons. First of all, they have a diameter of whatever that is, 0 0.0022 gogzillionths of an inch. All right. They weigh that many Gram, uh, grams, not grains, grams, all right, and that's a point, and that's, what do you got, 3, 6, 9, 12, 30, probably about 30, 36 zeros before you get to the 9. They move at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second. So they're very small in diameter, they're very light, and they move at a speed we can't even comprehend. You can't watch the particles in light move. They move that fast. All you see is brightness as a result of that. Now, that's very much like looking at an atom. Nobody's seen a whole atom. We can see how it works, what happens when we do this to it, what the results of that are, but we've never seen it under a microscope. 
what you're looking at here is a model to explain how what atomic structure is and how it affects us. So it's, it's been developed to explain a phenomena uh, that we can't explain. So how many of these electrons cross this point right there or right here? Make a point anywhere you want. But wherever you make that point, count them. And when 6.24 times 10 to the 18th power or 600 gazillion, 240 hump and million, whatever that number is, I don't even know. I'm comfortable down here in the millions and billions. When we get out of there, I don't know what that is. But when that many exponentially, that 6.24 with 16 zeros, okay, 18 decimal places, when that many pass 1.1 second, we have one Coulomb, named after the gentleman that figured all this mathematics out. And that definitely gave him a headache, so he deserves that honor. But we also call that one ampere. When 6.24 times 10 to the 18th power electrons have passed one point in one second, we say one ampere of current. Amps are current. Current has passed. All right? One ampere has flown. Reality. Let's get away from a light gas and get into a heavy metal or a medium metal. Here's copper. This is what its atom would look like using the same theory. We have 28 protons, 28 neutrons in the nucleus. Very heavy positive charge body to which 28 electrons are attracted to because they're negative, it's positive. That's what keeps this thing from blasting off in, in space. If these were all positive and the electrons were all positive, they wouldn't be together. Uh, 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 like charges repel each other and the electrons will go flying off into space. Now, this electron has a very strong pull to the nucleus. This one does. This one has a little less. And this one, called the valence electron, has even less of an attraction because it's one, two, three, four rings away from the nucleus. This is the electron that leaves this copper atom. Now, remember if we took half a million copper atoms and put them side by side, shoulder to shoulder. Half a man could hide behind one human hair. That's how small this whole arrangement is, we believe, theoretically. But when this electron leaves this orbit, it creates a void that the next copper atom will fill with its variance, its, its uh, valence electron. Quantum, quantum physicists call that the quantum leap. It's very, very small leap. They can see it leave. They can see the new one enter. But they can't find it anywhere in space between the two. That's quantum. It's a, a leap of faith, essentially. You have to believe that it, we see it happening. We see it leave, replace, leave, replace. But we don't see it in between. We know it's moving, but we can't explain where it is when it leaves or which of the copper atoms, because they're all identical, which of the copper atoms replaced that particular valence electron with its particular valence electron. But that's what happens. You excite the material with electricity, and when the valence electron leaves and goes to another atom, we call that the flow of current. And when 6.24 times 10 to the 18th power, 624 gazillion of these things move in one second, we have one ampere of current. Think of these as uh, grains of sand in a sand blaster, if you need to have an impression. But I want you to understand this is a physical movement. Now, this is what I call the great water analogy because it, it is a great analogy, and water does make a good <clears throat> analogy to the flow of electricity. Over here, I got a water tank and a water gauge in the bottom. And I got a piece of tubing connected to the bottom of this tank and I have a valve. As I fill this tank up with water, this gauge increases in pressure. For every 2.31 feet, every 27.72 inches in height that I fill this tank, I get one pound of pressure. If I double that, I double the pressure. Now I got two pounds. If I have 20 some feet of height, I have 10 pounds of pressure. So I have two things in this tank. I have water 
and I have pressure. The pressure works against the inlet of this valve. And as soon as I open this valve, the higher pressure read by this gauge in the tank will go to the lower atmospheric pressure. Because Mother Nature says, if I have more of something and I have less of the same thing, I want them to balance out. I want balance in nature. I don't ever want to, to hold something higher than something else. I want them to equal out. I don't care if it's air, water pressure, what it is you're dealing with. If there's more BTUs in one place than another, more heat in one place than another, I want them to be at the same temperature or have the same BTU value. I want that to, to balance out. If there's a higher air pressure in this tank than there is in the atmosphere, I want when this valve opens, I want the two pressures to equalize. I want the higher pressure in this tank to go to atmospheric until they're both at the same pressure. That's Mother Nature. Over here, we have an AC generator, alternator, whatever. This thing, as it rotates, makes electrons. It makes electrons. So the more electrons it makes, the higher the electrical pressure in the tank, just like this. The water is the electrons. The pressure in that tank that pushes the water out is voltage. Voltage is electrical pressure. So when I go about the process of making electrons and I put a voltmeter across here, just like my water gauge, the more electrons I make, the higher the voltage. That makes, and of course when I connect the circuit, the higher pressure in the generator pushes the electrons through the conductors. So the water is the same as the electrons, and the electrons are amperage. The flow of current. Electrons, current, amperage, all equal. All the same thing. You say I have uh, 10 amps. You're saying my current draw is 10 amps. 10 times 6.24 uh, times 10 to the 18th power. That big number times 10. Oh, it's 100 amps. Okay, then it's times 100 that. That's only 1 amp. All right, then it's that. 6.24 times 10 to the 18th power. At the voltage is the water pressure in this tank relative to the flow of electrons. Again, the more electrons you make, the bigger the voltage gets. You know? Typically, it comes out of a, you know, a power generating station at around 66,000 volts, something like that. Pipe. The pipe is a conductor. This pipe, as the water flows through it, offers resistance. You know that. If you make this pipe real small and the pressure here is real high, the water squirts out under high pressure. You don't get a whole lot of water flow. If you make the pipe bigger, then the water flows out quickly. Same here. Okay, this is, uh, this is the, uh, the uh, electron flow through a wire. If you have a boiler operating at 20 pound pressure, 18 pound pressure, and you've got a three quarter inch pipe connected to the pump in that circuit, then you've got about a three and a half gallon a rate flow minute. Three and a half gallons a minute flow rate. If you decide you want to quadruple that to 14, then you need a bigger pipe. The only way you could quadruple the flow through this is to increase the pressure. And we're, we don't have that option. We have a stable pressure inside this sealed boiler system, just like we do in this tank, just like we do in this generator. So wire is the same way. 18 gauge wire under the certain conditions and voltages can handle up to 10 amps according to the National Electric Code. But if you want to flow 40 amps, you need to have a thicker wire, 8 gauge. You go from 18 to 8, you've quadrupled the flow of electrons because now you've got a bigger wire, you've got a five lane highway instead of a one-lane highway. And a five-lane highway can handle five times the traffic a one-lane can. Some basic principles of electricity you really need to understand and get under your belt. The first one is this. In order for current electrons to flow through a conductor, three things are necessary. You have to have a power source, of course. You have to have an uninterrupted path. If you open up the path, the circuit, the wire, for any reason, nothing's going to flow. And you need a place to go to. Now, in the case of AC current, the destination is usually the source. 
because you're not going in one direction like AC. You're leaving here, you're going through a loaded device of some kind, and you're going back to where you started from. All useful circuits have resistance. Is this any less of a circuit? I have a power source, I have an uninterrupted path, this time through the screwdriver, and I have a destination. It's a circuit, but it's not useful circuit. It's going to blow the breaker, fuse, whatever, every time that circuit's energized, as long as that screwdriver is across those bare wires. Another principle. Whenever current flows through a conductor, a magnetic field is set up around that conductor. If I plug this into the wall and current starts flowing through this load, each of those wires is going to have a current, a magnetic field created around it. And that magnetic field is composed of magnetic flux lines. You can see magnetic flux lines. You can see magnetic flux lines if you take a uh, shavings, metal shavings, like from cutting and threading pipe. And uh, that's iron, you know, if you're doing iron pipe and you throw a big bar magnet in the box or the bucket, whatever, and you'll see all the slag line up, all the shavings line up north to south. What you're seeing is a physical representation of the flux lines that are, that are the magnetic field around this wire. And because 1 one twentieth of a second it's going this way and the other 1 twentieth of a second it's going the other way, because of that you need to split the wires when you hook up your amp probe. Your, your clamp on ammeter because you know if you clamp both wires together you'll get no reading because one direction will cancel out the other. And what you're reading with an amp probe is not, there's not a, when you clamp that thing on there's not some little guy in there that's counting the number of electrons that flow over one second. What you're reading is the intensity of the magnetic field. The more electrons that are flowing in that conductor the greater the magnetic field. And that's what you're reading is simply magnetism with a clamp on ammeter. In fact, uh, right here, what you see is uh, iron slag, you know, little chips or slices, very thin slices of iron, which enhances a magnetic field. And you can see when you lay a bar magnet in there, what happens? This is an image photograph, but you can see what happens. And in fact, Right here, you can see the lines of concentration spread out. And, of course, the further away you get with the slag from the magnetic field, the less drawn in the material is. Down here, it's pretty much like it began. But that's, if you had this magnet and this were your box, you were catching the uh, slag in from your uh, cutting and threading machine, and you put the magnet in there, that's pretty much what you'd see. And these are magnetic flux, F-L-U-X lines. Another principle we want to know about uh, electricity, because we use this all day long, uh, this magnetic effect, this induction, if you will. If a conductor, a conductor, a piece of wire right here, is passed through a magnetic field, a current is induced in that conductor. Right? There's no voltage around anywhere, no amperage around. I got a magnet and I got a piece of wire. But this piece of wire is a conductor, it's copper. And if I move it through the magnetic field, I'll get, if I put a DC voltmeter up here, this end and that end, I'll get a voltage. If I move it the other way, the needle will go this way. If I move it this way, you can make the needle do this all day long in a DC voltmeter, set for very low voltage. Another thing that happens, likewise, if a magnetic field is passed over a conductor, a current, again, is induced in the conductor. So I can move the magnetic field. If I move it this way, the needle goes here. If I move it back this way, the needle goes the opposite way, and I can make that needle dance. All right? Because I've exposed a conductor to a magnetic field. And you can do this at home if you've got a big uh, horseshoe magnet. Just take a piece of wire, put your DC voltmeter across it, set it for the lowest volt scale you have, and either move the wire up and down through the field or move the field over the wire. You're going to see that happen. Ohm's Law. George Simon Ohm, 1789, 
died in 1854. Told us everything we needed to know to get started to understand electricity. Ohm's law says that the current passing through a conductor between two points is directly proportional to the potential difference. That is the voltage drop or voltage across the two points and inversely proportional to the resistance between the points. Inversely means it goes in the opposite direction. So if, it's, if the voltage is inversely proportional to the resistance, as the resistance increases, the voltage, uh, the voltage decreases, the amount of voltage that can go through the resistance. Don't worry about this definition. It's not on a test anywhere, nor is the picture of this seriously, seriously ugly man. What we got here, and God bless him, I, I'm teasing George. Uh, what we have here, and these dates aren't important, I, I wanted to introduce it to you that way. Here is how we're going to handle it. We're going to deal with E equals IR. When you sit down to take the test, in the test envelope, they will give you, among other things, test booklet answer sheet. There will be a blue piece of paper in there for the NATE exam. The blue piece of paper, the back of it, you use for scrap paper. If you need more scrap paper, the proctor will supply it for you. But that's your basic scrap paper and probably going to be all you need. The first thing you want to write down is this on the back of that piece of paper. On the front of the piece of paper is a place where you can make comments about the exam. Uh, question number 15 doesn't have a correct answer. Question number 34 has two correct answers. I don't understand question 7, you know, whatever. I, I think this is a great exam and Jack Rye should be given a Medal of Honor. Things like that you can put in, the <laughs> in the, uh, that blue piece of paper. It's optional. You don't have to fill it out at all. But if you use it or don't use it, you have to turn it in, even if you've only used it for scrap paper. Everything that's handed out must be turned in in a proctored exam. If you don't have all the parts when you go up to the proctor at the end of the exam, he's not going to accept it. And you will have a problem then. Anyway, E, E, here's the formula. E equals IR. So you write down in the back of this piece of paper up in the corner somewhere, you put E over IR. I don't care if you use a triangle, a circle, or you just put E above IR. But you got to learn this. E is electromotive force. It's voltage. Back in George's day, they didn't know about voltage. He developed it. He understood it. He experimented with it for the first time. So it became known as electromotive force. I is intensity, amperage, what we now call amperage. And R is pretty much held its own as resistance. And we read that relative to ohms. That is to say, we, we say X is a certain ohm value, that the intensity is a certain amperage, and the electromotive force is a certain voltage. So it's volts, and you can't use that because it, you'll get all messed up, but volts are going to be over amperage and resistance. Okay, So when you sit down the exam, you write this on a piece of paper, because if you don't, you're going to get, and there's one other thing you got to write down, but this you have to. If you don't, you're going to get confused. They're going to say, which of the following formulas is Ohm's Law? And they're going to give you four different, A, B, C, and D, four different formulas, and you're going to be going nuts trying to remember which one is accurate. Because algebraically, this could work out almost anyway. So write this down, and you can refer to it. I do. Anytime I take an exam, I write this down, and I write pi down, which we're going to talk about in a minute. When they say to you, solve for voltage, E, what do you do? Well, E equals IR, so I multiply what's left, what I can see, if I cover this up with my mind. I multiply the amperage times the resistance, and I'll get the voltage. What if they say to you, solve for resistance? You're given 240 volts, 6 amps. What is the resistance in ohms in that circuit? Well, divide the amperage into the voltage and you'll get the resistance. So when you cover it up, whatever's left, that's how you do it. In other words, you cover this up, you multiply that by that, because they're multi in multiplication position. If you were to move the hand over here, over amperage, and you wanted to, uh, you wanted to know what the amperage was, you'd have to divide your, divide your voltage by your resistance, and you'll get the amperage. That's the way this triangle works. It'll save you tons of time. 
and you don't have tons of time. You got 150 questions to answer in four hours. 150 in four hours. It's a little over two minutes a question. This is not on a test, but for your information, if you can use Ohm's law for three phase, but you have to divide by this, you have to multiply e by the square root of three for it to work out properly, because this again is the square root of three. 1.73 times 1.73 is 3. Caution, you cannot apply Ohm's law for R. In other words, you can't solve for resistance in an AC inductive load. It doesn't work out. Read the volts times the amps on the box. Put an ohm meter across the meter if it's an inductive load like a motor, and it ain't even going to be close. Inductive, you say, what is an inductive load? What is two loads in our world? Inductive and resistive. Now you have capacitive and reactive and all that stuff, but let's, let's talk about the purity of uh, our business right now. And most loads you encounter are going to be inductive or resistive. An inductive load is an AC electrical load in which the voltage wave reaches its peak before this current. In other words, the voltage peaks before the current, the amperage does. You're going to have a high voltage relative to a current that's still trying to peak. An inductive, an inductive load uses magnetic fields, magnetic flux lines. Examples of inductive loads, motors, solenoids, those kind of things. If it moves, this is a good quote, if it moves, it's probably an inductive load. All right, if it has motion associated with it. Here you see, where is it down here? And this is why you got to stay with the EIR values, because when you start looking at other literature, E right here, that's the voltage line. Power is VA or watts, okay? And current is going to be I. You see the little I? Current line. So what happens in a resistive load, like a, a heater, an electric resistance heater, or a toaster? You know, you push the to put the toast in the toaster, pull the lever down, and immediately your amperage, voltage, and wattage peaks at the same time, okay? Until the toast pops, and then they all go back to zero at exactly the same time. That's resistive. Electric heater comes on. Immediately, you go to whatever your running amperage is and your voltage is going to be and your wattage. That's different from an inductive load. Look at this sequence in an inductive load. This is a motor. And what happened? Look at the E line. That peaked. The voltage E peaked long before the amperage did. Here's your I line. That amperage peaked way over here. This is no time. This is positive time. So in a time sequence, your voltage peaks then your, your wattage peaks, and then your amperage peaks in chronological order. So that's skewed. That's skewed off to the right as far as anything is concerned. That's what inductive is. Now let's talk about the next thing you want to write down. Beside E over IR, you're going to write down pi, P over IE. And all the textbooks say P equals E to I you know, uh, E times I. Well, whether you multiply E times I or I times E, you get the same number. So I make it pi so that it's easier to remember. This is real easy. E over I R, you're going to have to memorize because it doesn't have value. You're going to have to walk around, send it to your dog, to the wall, to the kids, to anybody that will listen, to the TV, all right, to E equals I R, E equals I R, E equals I R, until you got it in your brain because you're going to need it on the test a couple of times. Maybe as many as four or five times. All right. The same with this one. All right. So if you wanted to uh, solve for P power, you multiply amperage times voltage. If they say solve for amperage, divide the power, the the watts. Power is watts. Okay. Divide the watts by the the voltage, and you'll get the amperage. You want to solve for voltage? Divide the amperage into the watts, and you'll get the voltage. Whatever you cover up is what you're solving for. This is the calculation, just like we did in the other one. Again, three-phase, the voltage has to be multiplied by 1.73 in three-phase current. 
1 watt, remember? 1 watt is equal to 3.413 BTUs. 1 kilowatt, 1,000 watts, is equal to 3,413. Just move the decimal point over, you know, tenths, hundreds, thousands. Power factor, PF. What's that? Well, power factor is a ratio. It's a ratio of real power to apparent power. What the hell is that? Okay, no problem. Real power is the actual power being used by a circuit, motor, whatever. And it is read. How do you read this? Well, you use a watt meter to read this. If you hook a watt meter up to a, a circuit that's operative, you're going to get a watt reading out of it. Apparent power is derived from Ohm's law as volts times amps. In this case, apparent power means you go up to the motor, whatever it is, and you read the voltage at the motor, and you multiply that by the amperage you read with your amp probe. That's apparent power. That's apparently what there, what is there. The, the watt meter is showing you what's really there. So when I take a resistive load like this, my power factor is always 1 because everything peaks very nicely. I don't have any differences. Power factor is really going to show you how efficient that power or that circuit is. When I have an inductive load, it's always going to be less than 1. Because I'm going to take the watt reading, I'm divided by volts times amps, and that's going to give me a factor. So when I want to know what the wattage is, I have to multiply the volts times the amps, or the amps times the volts, times the power factor. And that's how you derive the power factor. And the power factor will typically be... 0.8 and up. It's very seldom you see it below that in, in our world. Usually it's in the nines. 0.92, 0.97, 0 0.98 is not unusual, depending on how efficient the circuit is. This is telling you how efficient the power is, or that circuit is in particular. That's power factor. Power is equal watts. The wattage that the circuit is actually using is equal to amps times the volts times the power factor. Transformers. Well, let's apply some of that junk that we were just talking about with magnetism and all that jazz. All right. Now, if I take an iron core and I make a bunch of turns on this side and I plug both of those, it's just one piece of wire wrapped around this iron core or in the vicinity of this iron core, and I take both ends of that wire and I plug it into the wall, I'm going to induce a current on this side. There is no electrical connection. This is insulated wire. There is no continuity between this wire and this wire. None whatsoever. All right? Or this group of wires and this group of wires. The way it works is this. The primary winding is the winding that gets plugged into power. The winding that receives the initial power source. The secondary winding is the induced current. If I plug this into a 120 volt socket, wall socket, I will, what happens when current flows through a conductor? You know that. A magnetic field is set up around a conductor. And if I condense that conductor into a small area by creating a whole bunch of uh, wraps around pole here, then I'm going to get a big magnetic field. This magnetic field is alternating every 1 20th of a second. There's two alternations within one one sixtieth of a second. You go from zero to positive to zero to negative to zero again. So you have two in one second this thing is going to turn hundred and twenty times. What happens when a magnetic field is moved around a conductor? It induces a current in the conductor. So the primary magnetic field is going to cut across the secondary winding and induce a current there. Inside of this transformer, there's no physical connection. If there is, you have what we call a shorted <laughs> transformer. It's not going to work. You're going to let the smoke out of it. You let the smoke out of it, it doesn't work. Now, you notice this iron core. Why is that there? Well, iron enhances the magnetic field. The, the magnetic polarity of the earth is determined by the, the the iron that's in the earth. One of the, one of the big things in the molten center and the revolution and all that jazz. 
But you'll notice that this is not, when you pick this thing up, it weighs 150 pounds, or at least for its size, it seems that way. Now, you'll notice also that this is not one big block of iron. It's slivers of iron, and they do that to increase the surface area, because if this was one big block, you'd have one, two, three, four, six sides for surface area. But if you make it little one-eighth inch slivers or whatever, then you increase that by the number of slivers you have. So your surface area magnifies even further, and your magnetic flux field increases even further. Every induction transformer you pick up in the field works exactly this way, whether it's step up or step down. In this case, we're stepping down. We're going to have, and remember, the current's going in this direction, it goes in this direction, and that magnetic field cuts across this conductor and induces a current and a voltage. Of course, you can't have one without the other in this secondary winding. If I have 5 to 1 turns ratio, and that's very common in these type of transformers. That means for every turn in this, I have five turns in this field for every one in this field. That makes it a step down. If it was a step up, it would be something like one to five, not five to one. I can get 24 volts out of this 120. That's how the transformer works. Now, there's a bunch of calculations, at least three major calculations you're going to need for this exam relative to what I just showed you. The first thing is this. You're going to get a question something like this. Uh, what size transformer do you need if you have two zone valves at 24 volts and one amp each? Well, here's the formula. The transformer VA that you need is equal to, this is what you're solving for, is equal to the volts times the amps, because that's what VA is, volts times amps. And what is VA? Volts times amps is watts. So the power, when you say I have a 40 VA transformer, what you're saying is I have a 40 watt transformer that it draws the same power as a 40 watt light bulb if my voltage is 120 volts. Volts times amps times 1.2. 1.2, the 20% additional, is inrush current. It's called inrush. Inrush current is low voltage lock rotor current. Let that swirl around in your brain for a minute. When you have a uh, line voltage device like a compressor, and it, it says on the tag it draws 20 amps during normal running operation, when it starts, because it's an inductive load, it draws four to five times that amperage for the few seconds that it takes to get up to speed because it's a, a locked rotor current. It went from dead stop, no motion, and now it has to get up to 3,400 RPM or whatever it is in a few seconds. And that's going to have a heck of an amp draw associated with it. That Remember looking at the inductive load curves? That's going to skew way to the right, and it's going to be huge. It's going to be four or five times the running load. So if it draws 20 amps when it's running normally with no lock rotor current, when it starts, it draws 80 to 100 amps, four to five times the amperage. Now, this ain't line voltage. It's 24 volts. So in that case, we have a much smaller amperage. Voltage drives this, remember. So we're only going to have about a 20% load. And when is that additional 20% inrush going to come in? When both zone valves are calling at the same time. Then you're going to have a lock rotor low voltage current of 20% greater than if just one zone valve opened. And that's called inrush. And inrush current is always higher than regular running current, just like lock rotor current is always higher than the running amps. So if I do the formula, 24 volts, two valves at one amp each, times 1.2, I need a 57.6 VA transformer to open those two zone valves at the same time. Oh, that can't be right. We always use 40 VA on three, sometimes four zone valves. Well, take a look at the amp draw on the zone valve. If it's a low amp draw valve, like a V8043E.32, then you can put four, three or four valves on 140VA. But if it's drawing an amp, you can't have two valves on 140VA. So now you've got to go to the truck and get the 57.6VA transformer out of the truck that we all have in stock. Or put... 140 VA transformer on each of the valves. All right. Oh, I heard a terrible moan then, but 
Uh, do you want to continue to replace zone valve motors every year and or transformers every year? Or would you like to be done with that? You decide. Next thing, given a step-down transformer with a 115-volt primary and a 5 to 1 turns ratio, what is the anticipated secondary voltage? When I put my voltmeter across R and C on the secondary, what can I expect to see? And I should see it if this I read this correctly and my turns ratio is right. Well, here's the formula. The secondary voltage is going to be the primary voltage divided by the turns ratio. That's equal to 1. So I'm going to divide 115 in this case, because that's what I read, by 5, and that's going to say 23 volts. And I should put my voltmeter across R and C on that transformer with nothing else connected to it, and I should read 23 volts. If this goes up, that goes up. If this goes down, that goes down. When you get below 22 volts on the output, uh, the, the secondary side, because the primary side dropped below 110 or 109, uh, guess what? Most circuit boards won't even recognize AC alternating current below 22 volts. It'll cause a fault in whatever circuit board you're dealing with, flame rectification, whatever the case is. Here's the third formula that's important for this exam. A step-down 40 VA transformer with a 115-volt primary and a 24-volt secondary should not be connected to a load greater than what amperage on the secondary side? How, how, how can you figure that out? Well, pretty simple. Bring up pi again. What are we solving for here? We're solving for amperage. We want to know what I is. Cover it up. What are you going to do? Divide 40 VA volt amps, which is watts, by 24 volts. Divide 40 by 24, you get 1.66666. That's the, that's the load. That's the answer. Don't put more than 1.6 amps on the secondary side of that particular transform. Now we're going to look at uh, checking out a compressor. This is a single phase compressor. We have, I showed the internal overload here. This is, in, in real life, it's the size of your pinky fingernail. And uh, it's strictly that. It's a thermal overload. It's embedded right in the windings. And when the windings get too hot, it opens up. And, of course, because you depend on the flow of refrigerant to cool off the motor in this motor in the compressor, and it opened up and the motor's not running to cool it off and bring the refrigerant back. And because you're hermetically sealed, there's no way to, you know, make this happen in, you know, under six or eight hours under doing that, what I think is ridiculous idea of duct taping a hose to the top of this thing, go off and do... Uh, two or three or four service calls and then come back to the job and hopefully it's cooled off and reset and you can start it up again. But usually what happens in my experience, you get back and the compressor is now washed out into the driveway from all the water. Worse than that, now you have to stand in water with wet feet and work on 240 volt current that could be up to 60 amps in a residence. To me, that's uh, not well thought out. If you have that, what you want to do is something completely different that we'll discuss in another program, but it involves just throwing liquid into the low side because the first law of thermodynamics says something with more heat goes to something with less heat. And you will get a significant amount of uh, the heat out of the compressor if you, if you do that, and you won't have to put the water on at all, and if you do, it will only be for a very short period of time. But if you, if the compressor is not running, it's not drawing amp, and you put your hand on top of it, or better yet, you can't put your hand on top of it, you can be guaranteed the thermal overload inside that compressor is open. And without doing something about it, it could take six to eight hours for it to cool off, depending on how warm it is outside. Um, so this, again, is very small. I'm just doing this to show, uh, just to show you that it's there and point to it. You walk up to this compressor, and you see I, I 
I call these terminals A, B, and C because they're unmarked. And what we're trying to establish here is what's the common, what's the run, what's the start. And C is not common. It's just A, B, C. It may be common. I don't know. We haven't done the work yet. But here are the rules. The rules say that the pair with the highest ohm reading is not common. In other words, when you put your ohm meter and you do this test with an ohm meter, all these wires are disconnected, all three, and you have an ohm meter that you've set on your R times 1 scale. Don't use a little cheap ohm meter that might be part of your amp probe and it has a little small ohm scale on there. You're not going to read anything because it's not sensitive enough. So you set it on R times 1. Hopefully you got an analog ohm meter. That's all I'll use. I think digital meters are great, but not for resistance. I want to see the needle move myself. And you put it across, you put it across, you put it across. You take reading from each pair. And when you find the highest reading, if you, for instance, were from here to here and that was your highest reading, that means you're not on common. The thing you're not on is the common terminal. And we'll explain that in a little detail in a second. The next highest pair is start. The remaining terminal is run. That's the rule. Remember the rule. Now, here's how we apply the rule. First thing you do, call them 1, 2, and 3, A, B, C, I don't care. But write it down on a piece of paper. You think you can remember all these, you'll, you'll forget them. I'll tell you right now you're going to forget them. By the time you get to the third one, you'll forget which pair was which. So A to B, you read it. On the ohm meter, it says 2.5 ohms because you're on your R times 1 scale. So you can read that accurately, especially with a digital ohm meter. All right? That's where the digital does have an advantage. That's A to B. You go B to C. B to C says, oh, uh, 3 ohms. All right, you write that down in the back of your lunch bag. B to C was 3 ohms. And only one more reading, and that's A to C, because that's all the pairs that are left. And A to C says half an ohm. Good. A to C, half an ohm. I got everything I need to identify these terminals. Well, remember, if I ask you the question, which is the common terminal? You know the rule says the pair with the highest ohm reading is not common. Which of these had the highest ohm reading? Right here, the one in the middle, right? And that was B to C. So if I was across B and C and I had my highest reading, that means A is common. And that is exactly what happened. A is common. Now we're left with B and C. Which of these is start? Well, what's the next rule? The next rule says the next highest pair is start. Well, you know where common is now, so from common to B or common to C was highest. Which was it? Well, it was A to B. A to B had a higher resistance than A to C did. The result of that, this becomes start. What's the last rule? The remaining terminal is run. There's only one terminal left. That ain't hard to do. Process of elimination. That's how you identify unmarked terminals. On a, this has to be an operative compressor. It doesn't have to be running, but this has to be made and it has to be a, a sound motor. Good compressor, common to start plus common to run will always equal run to start. Common to start resistance, because remember, this is nothing. That's a switch, so from here to here is zero ohms. So basically what you're saying is the start winding and the run winding is equal to run to start. And of course it is. If you put your ohm meter here, that's going to be your greatest resistance. This is going to be your least resistance, and this will be the next higher resistance. All right, so common to start plus common to run should equal start to run. Always any compressor that's single phase. Checking out an open internal overload on a single phase compressor. First thing, you want to make darn sure the compressor is cool before you do this. Because if the compressor is hot, it's going to show open. Go from common to run. If you read half an ohm or some distinct value, that overload is not made or you wouldn't have read infinity or OL on a digital meter. Okay, if this were open. Then there's only one other place to go, and that's common to start. And remember, we're trying to see if this is open. 
And if you read a definitive value in this case, if we're using the same compressor, you would have read 2.5 ohms. If you do, that's, that means this is closed, and that thermal overload, in fact, is not open. If, however, you read infinity, that is to say the needle number moved from the left, or the digital meter said OL, overload, that meant the circuit is open, and this, in fact, is open. So if either of these readings come up OL, but do both, because if they both come up OL, this overload is open. If only one of them comes up over overload, OL, then that winding is open, not the overload. Process of elimination. Make sure you check for open overloads after the compressor has cooled off, because if it's hot, it's probably the thing that caused it to stop running. And usually that's a lack of your charge is low because you don't don't have enough charge in it. The suction gas is coming back or too warm to cool off this motor as it runs. Checking for short to ground. How do you do that? Well, there's only two places to go again. You only have two windings. There's no such thing as a common winding. All right. You have a common terminal, but no common winding. All right. The common terminal just gets you to one side of each of the other windings, usually through the overload. But if you read from the start terminal to a ground that's tied to the compressor, whether you scrape the paint off the side of the compressor or you go to the copper pipe that's connected to it, as long as you don't have a, uh, a, an insulated joint, then you'll, you, you should read open. You know, you should read OL or infinity on an analog meter. All right? If you read a value, it's closed and you've got a problem. You've got a short part of this wire is now hitting the terminal. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the side of the compressor. Do the same thing on run. Okay, you should read OL on a digital, infinity on an analog meter. If you read a definitive value, half an ohm, two ohms, ten ohms, dead short to zero, whatever, part of this winding is touching the outside of this case. That's how you check for a short to ground. Three phase. On three-phase equipment, typically, you have three overloads, one in each of the three windings. Sometimes you'll have a common, one common, but usually you have three in the decent compressors. All windings have the same resistance on three-phase. There is no difference. You're not going to have a start run in common. Typically, they're going to be marked T1, T2, T3. All right? Each winding has its own overload. Typically, uh, that there is exceptions to that. Reverse rotation by any three-phase motor, blower, compressor, I don't care, by changing, interchanging any two leads. If I take two off and put it where one is, take one off and put it where two was, if this rotation were this way, it's now going to be this way. And if I interchange them again, it's going to go the other way. And if I interchange any two of these, it will go the other way. That's the way that works. The thing to be concerned with here is imbalance. Limit the voltage imbalance to 2% because it's exponential. If you have a 2% imbalance in voltage, then you're going to have a 4%, it's exponential, uh, increase in heat. And heat is what kills motors and all electrical devices. Expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. Eventually the insulation breaks down, shorts out to the winding it's laying over, and you have a short. This happens very often in three-phase. This is not on a test. Don't lose any sleep over it. Know that imbalance is bad, and that 2% is the maximum. You get a strip mall, very common. Electrician goes in before they even put the interior walls up, and he runs all the lighting, and you've got a three-phase panel. And what does he use? Two of the legs. He does an attempt balance, very common, because it's easier. He just takes the leg one, leg two, and does all the electrical wiring in the building. The bank comes in and decides it wants three of these units and is going to put them all together and make it its own. Well, now you need a three-phase piece of equipment because of that large heat loss, heat gain you have. So you bring a three-phase piece of equipment in and you hook it up to three-phase current, and the problem is you have a tremendous imbalance in one of the legs because two of them are used for all the lighting in the building and the other one wasn't used for anything. You're going to have an imbalance. And if you're smoking compressors 
on packaged equipment where oil flow and that kind of thing, oil return is not an issue, take a look at the voltage imbalance. Unfortunately, you have to make this test while the unit's running. And uh, that ain't easy to do unless you have a three-phase contactor that doesn't have a single-phase condenser fan coming off it or something like that. All right. Compressor, external wiring to this compressor. Here's a PSC. Here's a, a, a capacitor start, capacitor run. Notice all capacitors are wired across run and start, all of them. Even the run capacitor and start capacitor here are paralleled across run and start, and that they are always in series with the start winding. So if this capacitor opens up, the start winding comes out of the circuit. You're going to play hell trying to start that compressor with just a run winding. The same thing is going to happen over here. If you lose the run capacitor, because they're paralleled, when you parallel capacitors, the capacitance adds. So if this was a small 5 mic run capacitor and this was a big 300 mic uh, microfarad start capacitor, it's probably not going to make a terrible amount of difference. But if this was a 30 microfarad run capacitor, that could affect your starting torque because you lost 30 microfarad out of two or 300. That's 10% or more. So they're in series with the start winding, both of them. Um, the potential relay coil is wired across start. Here's the potential relay coil of this potential relay. Across start and common. goes back to the common side of the compressor. You can hook it up there. You can, you're probably going to hook it right back up at the contactor. But it has to be the opposite pole of what feeds the start winding in order to have proper Otherwise, you're going to have a short if you hook it back up here. And, of course, the potential relay is marked 2 and 3, or the uh, 2 and 5 are the coil. 1 and 2 are the normally closed switch of the potential relay. And, you know, your one side of your capacitor gets hooked up to terminal 1 also, and the other side of the start capacitor gets hooked up to the one side of the contactor, the other side of the contactor. So a potential... A start kit includes the potential relay, which is all this stuff here. That's the uh, uh, switch and the coil, all right? And it includes that potential relay plus the start capacitor. That's the kit. The capacitor and start relay contacts are in series with the start winding. The start capacitor and the start relay contacts are in series with the start winding. Know all this stuff about these two different devices. And this is this, you know, we just added a start capacitor to it, a potential relay kit. Compressors in a vacuum. A lot of spoof out there. You hear the old timers talk. They say, oh, uh, you know, when you're pulling a vacuum on a compressor, especially a small uh, refrigeration system fractional horsepower compressor, it's always a good idea when you get into a deep vacuum, and I don't know, most of them don't know, can't spell what a deep vacuum is. They say bump the compressor a couple times. That'll cause the oil to surge up and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, allow any trapped refrigerant in the oil to be vaporized and pulled off by the pump. Any, I'm sorry, any trapped moisture that might be in the oil to be vaporized from that disturbance of this unit starting. Absolute garbage. Okay? Please understand that. Do, do not bypass or whatever you got to do, the low pressure switch or any other device on there to get a compressor in a vacuum to start up because when you, if you have a real good vacuum like you should have, like 500 microns, and you're reading it with a micron gauge and you know that as a matter of fact, then you try to start this up, these, these uh, terminals on the outside of the compressor, common start and run, are bare. And the bare spade connections go over them. Well, it's the same on the inside of the compressor. You know what a superconductor is? A superconductor is a conductor that has no resistance. The air has tremendous resistance in it. It's a wonderful insulator, air. 
But when you eliminate all the air inside the compressor because of a deep vacuum, what you've created in the air is a superconductive field that this voltage will jump to the nearest ground to if you try to start it up, if you apply power to it on the inside of the compressor. I've seen it happen where they've uh, been to uh, factories that have actually constructed glass Pyrex type containers that you can see into, pull the vacuum and then start up a device inside of it. It looks like the 4th of July. Sparks flying all over the place because the air won't stop it now. It can't. And this is voltage. It's very excited. It's moving at the speed of light and it's looking for a ground. It'll jump from terminal to terminal. It'll burn out this fusite plug. It'll jump from this terminal to the nearest metal surface inside. It's the way it works. Don't start up a compressor in a vacuum. Relays. Well, here's a single pole double throw relay. Here's the coil. Here's a single pole double throw switch. One normally open, one normally closed switch. When is this motor going to start? When here's the power source, here's my controller, and here's my control device, if you will. They're all in series with each other. When does current flow? when you have an uninterrupted path. So if somebody pushes this switch in, the fan switch, I will have continuity between R and G. Current will flow through this conductor, uh, through this coil, and when it does, this switch will close and this switch will open. And when this switch closes, power goes to that motor from the line voltage source. So I am using this is now called an isolation relay, this relay right here. I am using it to isolate low voltage control circuit from a line voltage load. So I can control a 120 volt motor from a 24 volt thermostat. Do it all day long, you know that. I can bring on a 60 amp compressor, 240 volt outside from this same thermostat. All I have to do is jump out R and Y. If I take this thermostat off the wall and I put a jumper wire between R and Y, the outdoor unit's going to start. But the fan indoor won't because the fan circuit G is made through the thermostat, through the thermostat and its subbase. But when I take the thermostat off the wall and I'm dealing just with the subbase, I don't necessarily have this continuity between Y and G. And when I jump out R to Y, outdoor unit will come on, not the indoor unit. And when I jump out R to G, the indoor unit will come on, not the outdoor unit, because I've lost my continuity. I took my thermostat out. Understand that. Capacitor testing. If you're using an analog ohmmeter to test the capacitor, this is what you do. You short the capacitor out first. Then you put your probes across it. You set it on your highest ohm scale. And they're going to ask you about this in the test. What you're going to get is this. The needle is going to deflect hard to the right and fall back slowly. It's only going to do it one time. You're going to be starting here at infinity. You're going to hook up that second terminal. And the minute you do, it's going to go hard to the right. The bigger the capacitor, the longer it's going to stay there. And then it's going to fall slowly back to the left. And what you prove by doing that is not that it's necessarily good. It probably is. But what you've demonstrated is that it's taken on electrons and then discharged them. It's collected electrons on its, pay, on its plates like it should and then discharged them as it should. Because that's what a capacitor does. It stores electrons all right, until the voltage that supplied the, that pushed the electrons through drops off. And as soon as it drops off, it discharges. It's a trigger. It's the way it works. So that, that proves that. The next thing that can happen, if you have a shorted capacitor, it will go to zero and stay there. It won't fall back. There's obviously a short now in the compressor. If you have an open, the needle never moves. That's the test you use when you have an analog meter and a high ohm scale you can do it with. All right. Otherwise, get a capacitor tester. Most of the meters you buy today have a... Uh, a microfarad scale on them anyway so that you can look and see what the uh, actual microfarad is of the capacitor uh, as long as the capacitor uh, is operative. Checking the continuity of a fuse. 
has a procedure like everything else. You know, there's a right way and a wrong way to do everything. Step one, they're going to ask you this, shut the power off. Step two, put your own meter across the fuse. I would have put step 1A in there. If you're going to remove the fuse, do it with a proper plastic, non-conductive fuse puller. And don't do it when it's raining out real hard. That's step 1A. Step 2, check across it with an ohm meter. What does this indicate? This is set on ohms. What does that indicate? I have zero ohms. Okay, so I have a dead short across there. Fuses are sized to protect the conductors, the wires that attach to them. This is a double element fuse, all right? And may be 25% larger than the MCA, the minimum circuit ampicity. For example, if you've got a 20 amp motor that's fused, it can be fused to 25 amps because you can take the 20 amps that motor normally runs at and add 25%, and that is a good fuse size. That's the way it's done in the real world. Open and close switches. If I have a good 120 volt AC power source here, that's my attempt at a sine wave, okay? And I made this diagram using Word, Microsoft Word, so don't laugh too hard. It's pretty good for using Word. If I have a closed switch, it's in good shape, and I have continuity through my load, whether this is a light bulb or a motor, I don't care, and I have an open switch, and I put a voltmeter across it, what is this voltmeter going to read? Well, it's going to read 120 volts. It's going to read the supplied voltage, the applied voltage. Because look where the meter is hooked up. This probe is going to read this side. It's like plugging it into one side of the receptacle in the wall, and this one, there's continuity through the motor, through the switch, gets plugged into the other side of the receptacle. It's the same as reading across the load. Whatever this value is, if it's 117 and a half volts, that's what you're going to read here. How about this situation? Same circuit, except now the switch is closed, not open. What am I going to read? You better read nothing. Zero. Nada. Not one volt. Not half a volt, not seven volts, nothing. If you read nothing, that means these contacts are good. You just did a check on the contacts of this contactor, relay, whatever it is. That's how you check them. If you get a reading, it's because you got pitting. Pitting, corrosion of some kind, dirt. You got a June bug that went in there last night because it was a little cool out and decided he'd stay warm in those nice brass contacts in there. And the next time you called for cooling, he got smoked. Or your heat pump called for heating and whatever the case is. He got crushed. And now he's causing a voltage drop. Well, what's the problem with voltage drop? Well, uh, drop the voltage. Remember, let's say this is a 120-volt compressor or a 120-volt motor. Drop the voltage down below 10%. All right, drop it down 12 volts. 14 volts, and you're going to smoke the motor. The motor is going to run hot. This is going to continue to drop because pitting is exponential. Today it's a 1 volt drop. Tomorrow 2 volts. Next time you look at it, 4, 8, 16. Oops, I smoked the motor. 32 volts drop. This motor can't run on 90 volts. It needs 120. And if it attempts to, it'll get hot, overheat, and you'll let the smoke out of it. A stupid thing like that can cause a line voltage load to fail. That's why you check these when you're doing your maintenance calls. Now, what is pitting? It's arcing of the contacts. Take a small desk fan or some kind of inductive load like that. Plug it into the wall, and while it's running, while the fan is turning, yank the cord out, and you're going to see a spark between the receptacle and the end of that plug. The reason is that's the electrical circuit trying to attempting to continue to flow. All right, but it can't because the air now being a, con a non-conductor is insulating it and stopping it. Once the gap became too large, that electron flow stopped and what you saw was a flash as a result of that. You do it in the dark, you really see it in a dark room. In fact, now plug in that fan again, but don't have it running. 
In other words, leave it in the off position, but plugged in. Now yank the cord out. You won't see a spark or an arc. And that's because there was no established flow of current. Well, in commercial residential work, you don't have the luxury of turning switches off and on. You've got a set of contactors that usually pulls in a pretty heavy load, either a, a blower motor, or a, a compressor motor, something like that. And every time they open, they arc. That's the normal expected thing to happen. They will arc. If you work on units at nighttime, turn your flashlight away for a minute while it's starting, if it's dark enough out there, and you can, even if the contactor is sealed and there's a little gap around the seal, you'll be able to see a little flash inside there. If it's an open contactor, you'll clearly be able to see it every time it, every time it opens up. Not necessarily every time it closes, but every time it opens, you'll see that arc. And that arc oxidizes whatever is in the air because of the heat, and it deposit, gets deposited on the contact points, the two points that come together, the two plates that come together. And it's exponential. It gets, it's a snowball. Every time it gets bigger, it gets a little bigger exponentially, 2 volts, 4 volts, 8 volts, so on and so forth. That's why it's bad. That's the damage it does. What they're going to ask you on the, on the test is what causes a voltage drop across a good set of closed contacts because there shouldn't be any voltage drop, not from this point to that point. That little piece of wire or piece of surface area doesn't have a voltage drop that this meter can identify. What if you put an ohm meter here and you disconnect power? You're, you're being cautious, all right? You disconnect power and you put your ohm meter across that open switch. What are you going to read? Well, you're going to read infinity. The needle's not going to move if it's analog. If it's digital, it's going to say OL, out of range, as it should, okay? What's it going to read in this situation? Same deal, open power, no voltage going across here. We really should disconnect this side of that power, too. Uh, we could go to ground and create a problem through the meter, but we're in a hurry, as always. So we're going to put the ohm meter across this closed switch, and what are we going to read? Uh, you're going to read dead short. You should. There shouldn't be any voltage drop across this, so therefore there can't be any resistance. If you read a resistance, 1 ohm, 2 ohms, 4 ohms, it's because of pitting. Pitting, dirt, carbonizing, whatever, bugs, dead bugs, whatever. Okay, don't, you know, bugs get in there all the time. I live in Tampa, too, most of the year, and uh, it's bug city, man. Okay, especially in the summertime when these units are operating. They will do anything to get warm, especially when the temperature starts to change. Okay, so we, we have the same situation here. Pitting will cause a, uh, uh, a reading of resistance across a set of contacts, and pitting will cause a voltage drop across the same set of contacts. And I tell my guys, anytime you read a 1-volt drop or a 1-ohm resistance, change the contactor. Because if you don't, it's going to go bad before the summer's out for sure, especially if you're doing this maintenance in the spring. Amp meter, hook it up. If the circuit's open, you're not going to see an amp reading. Unless amperage is flowing, you're not going to have, because this is reading the intensity of the magnetic field. And if there's no flow because there's no continuity, there's no magnetic field. You have potential to this point, but no flow. Here, switch closes. You're going to read whatever this motor draws, 9 amps in this case. Pretty straightforward. Pitting doesn't matter. This doesn't know if you have a voltage drop. All it's doing is reading magnetic field. If you have a voltage drop, you're going to have less of a magnetic field. That's all. But it's not going to be relevant to anything you're going to appreciate. Voltage drop. Now, this is voltage drop across or, or to an appliance, furnace, air conditioner. I don't care what it is. How do you check for a voltage drop? Well, Check the voltage with a unit not running before it starts, and then start it and see what happens. They should be the same. If the voltage drops, you got a problem, and that's how you tell. This shows, obviously, 120 and 120. We don't have a voltage drop. Maximum supply voltage deviation is plus or minus 10%. I'm not talking about voltage drop. I'm talking about the unit is stamped for a 120-volt motor, for instance, 
you can have plus or minus 10% of 120 volts, and this unit will operate fine. But let's say you had 110 volts when it was idling. When it starts, it should be 110 volts, too. If it drops off, you've got other problems. Wire is too small. Wire length is too long. Both. Maybe your power source is off. But this is why you want to check that. Because if you see 109 volts before the unit starts, don't start it. Call the power company. If you get 109 volts when you had 120 and it drops to 109, that's your problem, not theirs. Your wire, something's wrong with your wire. And also, according to the National Electric Code, line voltage and low voltage wiring may not be run inside the same conduit. The reason should be obvious that if you have line voltage and low voltage and the line voltage shorts out, you'll smoke the entire low voltage circuit, which would could well include... Uh, Relays, contactors, thermostats, it depends on which one takes the least amount of time to burn. All right? It'll save the others by burning quickly. Capacitors. I know we're jumping around, but that's the way it comes at you in the test, guys. If you, first of all, understand what this stuff means. You see this indication here? looks like a U with a tail on the front. That's the Greek letter mu. It's M in Greek, mu, M-U. F is farad. A one farad capacitor is the size of the desk you're sitting at. You know, take take the uh, typical desk in, a, in an office and uh, fill it full of volume, if you will, from floor to top, from side to side, and back to front. If that were filled, that would be a one, roughly a one farad capacitor. So micro farad mu means micro, which is millionths. All right, so what we're saying here, uh, uh, a 10 microfarad capacitor is 10 millionths of a farad. It's a very small value. A one farad capacitor is huge. I saw one one time at the Princeton Plasma Lab in Princeton University, Princeton, New Jersey, where they split atoms in the middle of the night. And uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was a real interesting tour. Anyway. If you parallel wire them, this is what it looks like schematically. This is what it looks like in the real world. Uh, if you parallel wire them, the capacitance adds. In other words, if I need 30 microfarad capacitor and I only have a 10 and a 20 in the truck, I can put them in parallel and end up with 30 microfarad. Now, the voltage remains the same or that of the smallest. That is to say, if I have a 440 volt capacitor and this is 440 and all the VAC rating is the volt AC rating is the maximum voltage you want to apply across that capacitor that's all that is you can you can use this on a 24 volt circuit if it's a 660 capacitor you can use it on a 12 volt circuit doesn't matter but you can't use it on a 700 volt circuit if it's 660 so when you parallel the capacitors the capacitance adds but the voltage if they're both the same that's the maximum voltage you can apply across it, whatever that number is. However, if it's two different capacitors, like a 440 and a 370, then you use the smallest value. Because what did George Ohm tell you about parallel circuits? All the voltage goes across all the loads. All right, It doesn't change. It's not series. In series, the voltage would divide across the loads. The result of this combination of a 10370 and a 2440 is 10 and 20 add to be 30, and 440 and 370 of the two, 370 is the smallest. So we can apply this combination, that parallel combination, to a 30 microfarad 370 volt AC circuit and be fine. No problem. How about series capacitors? Series gets a little funky. You're probably not going to use this in the field very much, or if ever at all. I think I've had to do it one time out of desperation. And that's only because of the way the capacitance divides. Now, this obviously is a series circuit, schematically, and this is what it looks like in the real world. In the case of a series circuit, the capacitance divides relative how can I say this? Relative to the reciprocal relationship it has. 
So if I have two, and by the way, whenever you put capacitors in uh, series, the voltage is going to add, and they must have the same microfarad rating. If they don't, you're going to you're going to smoke one. All right. So they have to be essentially the same capacitor. It's better if they're the same VAC. But the VAC will add because this is in parallel. I can now apply these two 220 volt capacitors in a 440 volt circuit and be fine. But because they're both 10 microfarad and now they're wired in series, I'm not going to end up with 10. I'm going to end up with 5 microfarad. A 5 440 is the combination of two 10 220s. Now, if I had three capacitors like this in series, uh, it would be one third of one, just like five was one half. So what would my, it would be 3.33 would be my final capacitance. If I had four of them, it would be one fourth of ten if you use the formula. Okay, I'm cutting across the lines, but it, it's one fourth of ten. So if I wanted a two and a half microfarad capacitor, and all I had in my truck was tens, I'd have to put four tens in series, and then. I would end up with two and a half microfarad, and 20, 40, 60, 880 volts would be the maximum <laughs> voltage I could apply across that circuit. All right, that's series capacitors are funky. You're, you're not going to do it very much. I, I had to do this one time just to get a five microfarad capacitor, but that that's rare. You know, usually you you can do it a different way. Series circuits. Let's talk about series circuits. That's a series circuit. I got a voltage source, and I have in series, I have three different resistances. They could be all the same, they could be all different, but these happen to be three different ones. The voltage in a series circuit is divided across each of the different resistances. And this is the math, and don't worry about the math too much. It's it's uh, uh, Ohm's law, but know what happens. Know these concepts here. It's going to divide across each of the loads. Why? Well, we only have one amp value, which we're about to show you is two amps. Okay, so if the amperage is the same in a series circuit at any point, and it is, then amperage times resistance is going to be the voltage drop. So across this 10 ohm resistance, I'm going to have a voltage drop of 20 ohms. Across this one, the 20 ohm resistance, I'm going to have a 40 volt drop. And across this one, I'm going to have a 60 volt drop. 60, 40, and 20 add up to 120. This total can never be different than this single value in a, in a pure circuit like this. And these will drop according to the resistance. If they were all the same resistance, they'd have exactly the same voltage drop. If there were three of them, it would be one-third of this. If there were four of them, it would be one-fourth of this supply voltage. That's the way voltage works in a series circuit. It divides. The total current flows through each resistance. And there's only one current because there's only one voltage if you apply only one resistance if you apply Ohm's law. The resistance in a series circuit adds, okay? 20 and, uh, 20 and 30 is 50 and 10 is 60. So divided by 120, I have two amps, whether I read it here, 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 here. Any place I read the amperage is going to be the same, even though the voltage is going to be different. Over here, I'm going to have a 20 volt drop with a 2 amp uh, uh, current flow. Over here, I'm going to have the same 2 amp current flow, but a 60 volt drop not 20. That's the way series circuits work. Know the laws. Resistance, you add the resistances up and that is the total resistance of that circuit is this plus this plus this. Why should AC loads never be placed in series? Well, thermostat, 24 volt step down transformer, two relays, identical, same coil. If you close this thermostat and the power flows through these relays, what you're going to hear here is clicking and vibrating and all that fancy stuff because the voltage 
divides across each of the loads. Now this 24 volt power supply is dividing equally because these are the same relay 12 volts across each relay and you're trying to use 12 volts to pull in a 24 volt contactor and that ain't going to happen. Any more than a 120 volt motor is going to take off and run when you supply 60 volts to it. It's simply not going to happen because this is a small low voltage inductive load. You can do this. This is great. You know, get a little transformer, uh, get your set of alligator clips that you can plug into the wall, get a switch, a toggle switch, or get a thermostat. Don't use mercury bulb unless you're going to mount it perfectly vertical on a wall, or get a snap action switch, whatever you want. Take two relays out of the truck and wire them in series. Use, uh, you know, alligator clips, whatever you got to do, jumper wire clips. All right, and you can show your guys right there. Look what happens. Then take it off, take one of the wires off, and convert this to parallel wiring. All right, rearrange this wire between the two, and you know you'll hear you'll hear them both click, pull in at exactly the same time, and you won't hear any noise. Parallel. That's that's series. That's series circuits. Parallel circuits look like this. You got a power source, same goofy Jack Rise attempt at a sine wave power source. And in this case, we have three parallel circuits with different resistances. What happens to the voltage? The total voltage is applied across each of the circuits. 120 volts goes across here, here to here, here to here. Wherever you put your voltmeter, you're going to read 120 volts. And there's the math. That's Ohm's law again. E equals IR. Okay? The current... The current is divided between the different loads, just like the voltage did in the series circuit, but now it's the current that divides across each of the loads relative to the resistance, because I equals E divided by R. The total current is the sum of all three of these circuits, or how many circuits you have. It's the total. 12 and 6 are 18, and 4 is 22. The total resistance is less than the value of the smallest resistance. Because remember the capacitors? We're doing the same thing. It's reciprocal in relationship. So if I have a total here of 60 ohms, all right, if I were to add them up, if they were in series, it would be a total of 60 ohms, 30 and 20 and 10. But they're not. They're parallel. So that same 60 ohms ends up seeing, if you will, this, this power source is going to see not even 5.5 ohms resistance. That's the way all parallel circuits work, and that's the way every house in the universe is wired. This is all, these are the lighting circuits and, you know, the kitchen circuits and all that jazz in your, uh, in your home. That's the way it's done, parallel wiring. And this fuse is sized for this plus this plus this and you do the math. 1 divided by 1 over this resistance plus 1 over this resistance plus 1 over this resistance. And that gives you your total resistance that that fuse is actually going to see. And that therefore, that times the voltage drop is going to give you the size fuse you need. See this written on a uh, thing that looks like uh, uh, some kind of uh, contactor or maybe a real small contact or some kind of relay or something like that. It's probably a sequencer, what they typically call a heat sequencer, even though it's used in a cooling mode. And what you need to know is what this notation means. Now, I took this right out of White Rogers catalog. And H1-20 and C40-110 means this. Okay, and I'll read the description, but... Uh, or you can read the description. I'm sure you're capable of that. But basically what it means is after a call for heat, 1 to 20 seconds later, the heating contacts are going to be energized, probably to bring the fan on, depending on what they're connected to. And on a, So it's a delay on in the heating. And in the case of cooling, after the call for cooling stops, you're going to have a delay off of 40 to 110 seconds. Why would you want that? Well, you want to take off whatever. Once the condenser shuts down, that evaporator is still cool. 
So you want to take that cold air off and distribute it through the house. It's free. All you're using to capture it is the fan. The power the fan is using, the compressor is off, but that coil is still cold. So this is a delay off and cooling. That's the seconds, the timing. And they're just resistors that are built in, so they're, they could be anywhere from 40 to 110 seconds on that delay. It depends on how hot the circuit is and what environment you have it in and so on and so forth. And the heating, in the case of heating, when, once that burner lights, somewhere between as little as one second and 20 seconds later, the fan's going to come on and just start distributing the heat. That is what all this means. And they're called fan heat sequencers. White Rogers is a, a excellent manufacturer that makes this particular type, and that's where that nomenclature typically comes from. I think they may have ultimately been responsible for it. Thank you for your time and attention. Again, I know how how difficult time is for you. That's probably why you're using CDs instead of sitting in a class. So hopefully this first part has been a little help to you. And we got three more parts, so stand by and we'll get to it. What we're going to do right now is do a little Q&A because this is all about Q&A. You're getting ready to take an exam. Q&A time. Question and answer. Let's try number one. Electricity is. Now, these are not the questions on the exam. These are questions about what we just talked about, the areas that they ask you about on the exam. And other areas I thought I needed to, uh, I needed to augment your understanding of the areas they're going to talk about on the exam. So if I give you background and relevance, hopefully something will stick. The questions on a test are going to be a little more difficult than what you have here sometimes to the point of being vague. But if you understand the structure, the, 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 the area, if you understand it thoroughly, then vagueness takes a back seat to, you know, inspiration. <laughs> All right. Electricity is A, the potential difference between negative and positive poles. B, the induction of voltage through a resistance. C, the flow of electrons through a conductor, or all of the above, D. What is electricity? Uh, it's the flow of electrons through a conductor. Number two, voltage in an energized electrical circuit can be thought of as electrical pressure, electrical resistance, electrical flow rate, electrical volume. What is voltage? in an energized circuit. It's electrical pressure. Sure it is. It's the voltage that pushes the amperage, the electrons, through the conductors. All right? The conductors offer resistance. The more resistance, the less the flow rate. Three, whenever a current flows through a conductor, it will cause the voltage to peak before the current. The resistance will cause the current to peak ahead of the voltage. A magnetic field will be canceled out by the rising current, or D, a magnetic field will be established around that conductor. What happens whenever current flows through a conductor? Hey, generate a magnetic field. It's a basis for all relays, contactors, transformers, everything we use in our industry. Four, if a conductor is moved through a magnetic field, a magnetic flux, all right. If a conductor is moved through a field <laughs> of magnetic flux, you wouldn't believe I wrote these questions, would you? All right. A, a permanent magnet will be created in that conductor. B, the resistance of the conductor will be eliminated. C, a current will be induced in that conductor. Uh, yeah, conductor. Or D, a current will be established in the magnetic flux lines. What happens when a conductor is moved through a magnetic field? The current is induced in the conductor, without a doubt. Five, given a step-down 40 VA transformer with a 120-volt primary and a 24-volt secondary, what is the maximum secondary current load? What is it? 0 0.166, 1.66, 16. has something to do with 1666. That we've established. Or maybe it doesn't. You tell me. How are you going to solve this? Well, 
What are they asking for? Amperage. Where's the amperage? That's I. Cover it up. What are you going to do? Divide your voltage into your wattage. Okay? We said that it was a 40 VA, 40 watt transformer and 24 volts. 24 into 40, 1.66666. It'll go on forever. So the answer obviously is, hopefully obviously, is B. That's all. You, you never, you know, you start getting near, anywhere near an amp and a half, two amps total load on a 24 volt transformer, most of them are going to fall in this area. 1.7 is a common uh, uh, number you'll see because 1.666 rounds up to 1.7. Uh, but read the uh, read the literature. It mean hopefully it'll mean something to you now. If the primary voltage on a step down transformer is 110 volts and there is a five to one turns ratio, what's the secondary voltage? Well, 18 volts, 20, 22, 24. Okay, I guess at 24. Nah. Secondary voltage is equal to the primary voltage which in this case is 110, divided by the turns ratio, which is 5 to 1. 5 into 110, 22 volts, not 24. I know it says on the box it's a 24-volt transformer. That's a nominal number. If you apply 110 volts to the primary, you're only going to get 22 out of the secondary. Sorry, Charlie. If an internal overload on a compressor is suspected of being stuck open, permanently stuck open, then it should be checked while the compressor is still hot, after the compressor is cooled off, while the compressor is still running, after the compressor has stopped running. When do you check? At what point do you check that, that uh, device? After the compressor is cooled off. Because if it is hot, it opened, and it opened because it should have. And if it resets after it's cooled off, then it's still good. But sometimes they open and never reset. And therefore, that little thing the size of your pinky nail is going to cause you to replace the entire compressor and, in a lot of cases, the entire condensing in it. Because if it's old, if it's out of warranty, there's no sense, no, no economic value in just replacing the compressor. In question 7 above, the one we just did, what instrument would you use to make that compressor check? What are you going to use? How are you going to check and see if that thermal overload is open? You're going to use a voltmeter, ammeter, ohmmeter, or a magnahelic? What are you going to use? Well, hopefully you're going to use an ohmmeter. Power off, wires off the terminals, and you put your ohmmeter across it. Nine. Continuity from a compressor's terminals to ground will reveal what? If you have continuity between the compressor terminals and ground, that means you have an open winding. That means you have a short between windings, a short to ground, or none of the above. What does that mean? Well, it's a short to ground. A short between windings isn't going to show up on the casing. If something is touching the casing, you're going to see uh, continuity to ground. If the run capacitor on a capacitor start, capacitor run motor is open, the run capacitor, will the motor start? Yes, no, it might, but it will draw higher than normal running amps. And D, it will start every other time. What's going to happen when the run capacitor on a capacitor start, capacitor run motor is open? Well, it might start depending on how big or small that run capacitor was and how important it was to be in parallel with that start capacitor. Because remember, the compactance add. So if it's small, it'll probably start, but it's definitely going to draw more amperage when it runs because the running capacitor is out of the circuit now and it can't help that running load where the capacitor would if it were back in the circuit. It would reduce it and make it more efficient. 11, if the run capacitor on a PSC motor, a permanent split capacitor motor, is open, will the motor start? Yes, same options. No, it might, but it will draw higher than normal running amps, or it will start every other time. What's going to happen when the run capacitor is out on a PSC motor? 
it ain't going to start because it took the entire start winding out. It'll probably sit there and hum, but that's about the best you're going to get out of a compressor. Twelve, the start capacitor is in series with the run winding, the start winding, the start winding and the potential relay contacts, the common winding. Where is the start capacitor? Yeah, it's in series with the start winding and the potential relay, the normally closed contacts and the potential relay. This is not a current relay. A current relay has normally open contacts. This is a potential, a voltage relay, and it has normally closed contacts. That once the, they, they are normally closed, once its coil is energized and it gets up to about three-quarter speed, there's enough current to pull the, the uh, coil in and open up that contact and stay open as long as the compressor continues to run. As soon as the compressor stops running, the thing goes back to its normally closed position waiting for the next start cycle. Thirteen, the coil of a potential relay is wired across. The coil of the potential relay is wired across the run winding, the start winding, the start winding and the potential relay contacts start the common. Where, where, where does that coil belong in a potential relay? Yeah, cross one side, start. The other side, common. The opposite side of power. Fourteen. A compressor that is being evacuated should be started while in a deep vacuum so that any refrigerant that is trapped in the oil will be forced out. True? False? Only if the vacuum is greater than 500 microns. Only if the vacuum is less than 500 microns. What do you think? Yeah, completely, utterly false. Don't start a compressor in a vacuum. Fifteen, the use of a relay in a control circuit. The use of a relay in a control circuit allows, allows control of a line voltage load from a low voltage circuit isolates high amperage loads from high voltage loads, isolates low amperage loads from low resistance loads, or allows for automatic phasing of low voltage transformers. What, what's the answer here? Yeah, allows for line voltage control of a low voltage, uh, low voltage control of a line voltage load. Why do we use low voltage wiring in control circuits? Because they have to run all over the place, and if we have to, had to run line voltage wire, it would be a whole lot more expensive and less sensitive to minor changes. Okay, So we can run lighter wire and be a whole lot more sensitive. We can break down you know, uh, 4 to 20 microamps, you know, milliamps uh, of current. You are using an analog ohm meter to test a run capacitor. The needle moves quickly to the right towards zero ohms and then falls slowly back to the left toward infinity. This test demonstrates that the capacitor is open, that the capacitor is shorted, that the capacitance of the capacitor in microfarads, or D, that the capacitor is charging and discharging. What does that tell you? It's charging and discharging. It's taking on electrons and then releasing them. 17. To check the continuity of a fuse. A. Disconnect power, remove the fuse, and check for continuity with an ohm meter. B. Disconnect power and check for continuity with a voltmeter. C. Remove the fuse with a fuse puller and check for continuity with an ohm meter. And D. Check across the fuse with a voltmeter. How do you check a fuse for continuity? A, man, disconnect power, numero uno. Remove the fuse, check for continuity with an ohmmeter. 18. Fuses are sized to A, protect personnel, protect the conductor, prevent short circuits, avoid tripping. Why, how are few, why do you feel, I guess is the way it should be stated, they are sized to what? Protect the conductors, the wires from overheating and causing fires in interior walls, which ultimately protects personnel, but stated properly, it's to protect the conductors. 
If the minimum circuit ampicity of a particular motor is stated to be 24 amps, then the proper fuse size will be 20 amps, 30, 40, 60. 30 amps, 25% greater. Will a 40 amp uh, fuse work? Sure it will. You'll never have a, a nuisance complaint, that's for sure. But this motor could get awful hot from excessive amperage before you ever pull it offline with the fuse. Okay? And it, it will cause your... Uh, remember, the, the, the fuse is to protect the conductors, and the comp conductors on a 24 amp load, when that gets up to 40 or 60 amps, they've already smoked a long time ago. So the fuse size has to protect them. All right? 20. A voltmeter app applied across the open contacts of an isolation relay on an energized circuit should read, open contacts, energized circuit should read 0 volts, less than 7, the low voltage power, the applied voltage. What should you read across an energized circuit with an open contact? Yeah, whatever the applied voltage is to that contact from the source. 21. What is the proper reading of a voltmeter placed across the closed contacts of a relay in an energized circuit? What should that voltmeter say? Zero volts? Less than seven? The low voltage power? 24, whatever that is? The applied voltage. What should it say? Better say zero if the contacts are closed and if they're in good shape. If it says seven volts, you better change the contactor or whatever relay out right away. Because you get a seven volt drop to whatever it is, and if it's a line, uh, 120, 110 volt item, now you got 103 volts going to it. 22. What would cause a reading of six volts AC across the closed contacts of a relay in an energized circuit? What would cause a six volt drop across closed contacts? Counter EMF? A low voltage condition? Pitting, dirt, or dead bug. D, this is a normal feedback voltage reading. Believe it or not, a lot of people believe that. It's counter EMF, they call it. It's a normal feedback. No, it's a pitted contactor. Dirty contacts, and they just can't identify what the symptoms mean because they don't understand that it's a voltage drop they're looking for. 23, I hear it all day long in the field from guys. Maximum supply voltage deviation is plus or minus 2, 5, 10, or never greater than 2 volts per watt. What is the maximum supply voltage deviation? Plus or minus 10%. 24. How is voltage drop to a device determined? Divide the voltage by the amperage. Should have shown that algebraically. B. Read the voltage with the device running. C, read the voltage with the device not running. Or D, both B and C. Both B and C. You want to know if there's a voltage drop to something? Read the voltage before it starts and while it's running and compare them. They should be identical. All right, 25. According to the National Electric Code, low voltage and line voltage wiring may not connect to the same device, must always be isolated by an approved isolation relay, may not be run in the same conduit. The NEC does not regulate low voltage wiring. What's the correct answer to this question? Yeah, may not be run in the same conduit. May not be connected to the same device. What do you call a, an isolation relay? <laughs> 26. If I require a 40 microfarad capacitor, and the only capacitors on my truck with a proper VAC rating are a 10 and a 30 microfarad capacitor, how should they be wired? In series, in parallel, in series parallel, which you can also do, or D, no wiring arrangement will produce a 40 microfarad capacitor from the two capacitors you have available. What do you think? Yeah, huge. Put them in parallel. They add. 30 and 10 is 40. Last time I looked.
27. What happens to the voltage in a series circuit? It divides across each of the loads. It's the same at any point in the circuit. It reduces exponentially in the direction of current flow. Or D, it has a direct relationship with the resistance. What's the, what, what happens to the voltage in a series circuit? It divides across the loads. Series circuit, it divides. And it doesn't have a direct relationship. It has an inverse relationship with the resistance. 28. The result of two relay coils in series is the need for a larger VA transformer, B, increased amp uh, amperage at each relay, C, low voltage at each coil and contact chattering, or D, both relays will operate normally. What is the result of two relays, two relay coils in series? Right? Low voltage and chattering. The series, so the voltage divides across the resistance. 29. What happens to the amperage in a series circuit? It divides across each of the loads. The total current flows through each resistance. It decreases in the direction of current flow, or D, the change in current flow is directly proportional to the change in voltage at each device. What happens to the amperage in a series circuit? The total current, the total amperage, flows through each of the load. There's only one amp draw in a series circuit, and it's the same everywhere you read it. 30. What happens to amperage in a parallel circuit? Parallel circuit, what happens to amperage? It divides across each of the loads. Total current is the sum of each of the branch circuits. C, it is the same at any point in the circuit. Or D, both A and B. What do you think? Yeah, both A and B. It divides across each of the loads, but the total is the sum of all the circuits, all the parallel circuits. That's parallel resistance. Okay. Um, sorry about the spacing there. We have a uh, problem in the way this thing tr uh, forms when it's on a different screen than what it was originally written on. So sometimes you're going to see poor spacing like this in this program, and I apologize for that. It's just the nature of the beast. But let it, let it not distract us from the task at hand, which is question 31. You notice that a heat sequencer has the following indication, H1-20, C40-110. What the heck does that mean? A, the heating on delay is 1 to 20 seconds, and the cooling on delay is 40 to 110 seconds. B, the fan off delay is 1 to 20 seconds for heating and 40 to 110 seconds for cooling. C, the heating off delay is 1 to 20 seconds and the cooling off delay is 40 to 110 seconds, or D, spacing problem again, I apologize, D, the heating on delay is 1 to 20 seconds, and the cooling off delay is 40 to 110 seconds. What do you think that indication is? Yeah, it's D, man. The heating on delay is 1 to 20 seconds, the cooling off delay is 40 to 110. 32. A loose or corroded wire has the same effect as a resistor, a thermistor, a rheostat, a transformer. What do you think a loose or corroded wire? Remember what happened with corrosion in the contacts? It caused a voltage drop, didn't it? So it acted as a resistance. A thermistor, its resistance changes with temperature. And that doesn't happen with a corroded wire or a loose wire. Loose wire shakes and moves and that creates arcing which creates pitting which puts you in the same situation. A rheostat causes the voltage and current flow and everything to change relative to the resistance. Okay, Not here because this usually is adjustable, a rheostat. A transformer is a transformer. You know, it's just two coils of wire in proximity. So it's a resistor. 33. If the contacts of a potential relay on a capacitor start, capacitor run compressor fail to open, 
the potential relay contacts that are normally closed, if they fail to open, what's the most likely outcome? A, the run capacitor will also fail. B, the start capacitor will also fail. C, both capacitors will also fail. D, there is no problem. This is a normal condition. What do you think? Well, it's B. The start capacitor will also fail because that is only... Take a look at a start capacitor. It's made out of plastic. And a small start capacitor is 200 microfarad. Yet a 30 microfarad run capacitor is made out of steel because it's in a run circuit all the time. It's in series with the start winding, but it's in the circuit all the time. So when the compressor is running, it's still in the circuit. The start capacitor is in series with the normally closed contacts that are going to open and take it out of the circuit. If they don't, it's made of plastic. It's going to get real hot real fast, and it's going to explode. When you open up the unit, the electrolyte's going to be all over the place in the form of a, a, an acidic paste. Don't touch it if you can avoid it, all right? If you get it on your hands and you wipe your hands in your pants, expect holes where you wiped your hands in a few weeks, all right? Uh, as the acid eats away the, the, uh, the pant, the material. Also, the coil inside of that, not the coil, the uh, uh, plates inside of that are rolled up and put in there. It kind of looks like stromboli uh, when you cut it in a cross-sectional fashion, all right? And uh, it comes out like a slinky. It looks like, you know, somebody had uh, was playing jack-in-the-box and the box opened. So that, that's the effect of that. The run capacitor is going to be fine. It's in a parallel circuit. It's not in series with that winding, and it's designed to be in the circuit all the time. 34, during a troubleshooting procedure for a suspected problem with the heat pump's thermostat, you remove the R and Y wires from the sub-base, and jump them out. That means thermostats off the wall, you jump out R to Y. You notice that the outdoor unit starts, but the indoor fan does not. Is this a normal condition? Yes, no, are two good options. Only if the system switch is in the emergency heat position, or D, only if the system switch is in the heat position. What's the answer? That's a normal condition. Remember, G is picked up on the Y side of the thermostat whenever you go into the cooling mode. Or in the case of a heat pump, when you go into heating or cooling. But the fact is that G is only common with Y when the thermostat is on the sub-base and that sensing device is in the circuit. Okay, That's the point I'm trying to make there. 35. All electrical troubleshooting should begin with a check for proper polarity, a check for proper current flow, a check for, uh, for the continuity of each circuit, or a check for the presence of power. What do you think? Where are you going to begin every electrical troubleshooting uh, circumstance? You're going to begin by making sure you have power. Don't, if you think the gas valve is not opening, don't go to the gas valve and put your voltmeter across it. Because if you don't have power, if the switch isn't on, <laughs> nothing's going to work, including the gas valve. And if the transformer is dead on the secondary side, you still may have power going to the hot side of it, the uh, hot side of it, the primary winding. So check the primary, 120 volt. Check the secondary, oops, no voltage. Nothing wrong with a gas valve, or maybe there is, but you can't tell at this point in time. Start at the power source and work outward. That's the basic rule of thumb in electrical troubleshooting. If you don't got power, don't go no further. It's that simple. Hopefully we'll see you in the next part if we haven't burned you out in this part.